This is not the small print of the gospel. This is not some hidden message in scripture. Jesus made it very clear that a decision to follow was a decision to die, to surrender everything to him. And so Jesus turns to the crowd and he turns to you and me and he asks the one question that will ultimately define our lives. Are you a fan or a follower? I want to welcome you again to the Oasis Christian Church where we pray that we would honor and glorify Jesus Christ today while we're here. This is our fifth sermon in this Not a Fan series, and I love it when we're preaching on the same thing that our small groups through the week are learning about, the same topic. And we have at least one more week, week six of small groups in the sermon series, but like in our small group, we're going to continue meeting beyond that just because we're enjoying the fellowship so much. And we have so much going on. We, after we break, we're going to have a, over a month period there. Uh, Easter is on April 8th this year. So mark your calendars on that. It's going to be a big day. After that, a few weeks, we're going to have a pictorial directory where we're going to take pictures. We're going to then start into our Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University course in May. And we're hoping to do that two nights where everybody can participate. And I know some of you guys have done Financial Peace University before with Dave Ramsey. If you've done that, let us know that. We need your help with uh, uh, hoping to do some things with that with you guys. So let us know if you are, uh, have done the Financial Peace University course or not. But this Not a Fan series, I think, has challenged me. You know, am I a fan or am I a follower? And, and Luke 9.23 has been kind of our, our text for this series. And when Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And the question that we've been running through our minds is, are we a fan or a follower? And I've been thinking about that a lot this week. And you know, if you knew me the way God knows me, you wouldn't come here and listen to me. But you know, if, I, if we knew you the way God knows you, we wouldn't let you in. And, uh, and that's what we're dealing with in this because none of us are sinless. As we grow in Christ, we pray that we would sin less and less over the time, but we're going to fall short. And we need to make that transition from being just a fan to a follower. Today's message is entitled, More Than Just Rules, because we got this love for Jesus. We're going to look at a heart of a fan and the love of a follower. And uh, I want to run these scenarios by you. And I just want you just to think about that, because you can probably relate to some of these scenarios in your own life. Imagine if... You've got a coworker, and they display a Bible on their desk and they encourage, they lead devotions for their uh, office in the mornings and you come to know that person pretty well and you know that they lie to customers and they treat their employees disrespectfully. I mean, what would you kind of get the picture there? Or say your husband is, sings in the choir at church and he's a great guy, he's got a good friendship with the minister, but at home he's a bear. I mean. He's like Mr. Rogers at church and Mike Tyson at home. And he's got a temper and you know that. Or say you teach school and there's a school teacher that professes to be this wonderful Christian. And she kind of talks about that and kind of she's praised at church for all the good things she does. But you know behind closed doors and meetings that she uses profanity and vulgarities. I mean, what would you get the picture there? Or say a church friend of yours had recently been widowed and they meet the, this person of their dreams and it, not before long they're, she's bringing him to church and they're getting along and then they kind of move in together and they still come to church. I mean, what's the picture there? Well, these scenarios, I think, have two things in common. One is, as you observe scenarios like that, that it involves a level of hypocrisy of somebody acting a way that they don't say that they're acting. This word hypocrite comes from the Greek word, which means to wear a mask, to be two-faced, to be a play actor. In Greek theater, the actors would come out and they would wear masks oftentimes, and they would wear a, a mask of, of comedy. And then later on, in the, the, the same actor would come out wearing a, a mask of tragedy. Same actor, just different face. That's the word, that's the picture that you get from the word hypocrisy. A, 
a, a hypocrite is somebody who's a play actor and they're acting out something that they know that they should be acting out, but on the inside, they're really not following that deep down. The second thing about these hypothetical things that I talked about was that, that fans make life difficult for real followers. I mean, everybody, believers and non-believers alike, are turned off by pretense, by somebody just faking it. And the longer a person associates with a hypocrite, the more that kind of rubs off and we become mediocre even in our own life. And today we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to use Matthew, his gospel, in chapter 23. And it records Jesus' response to the, to the ultimate hypocrites of his day, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who knew the rules, who knew better, who were living out the rules. But deep inside, they were just, they had the heart of a fan, frankly. And we realize, I think, through studying this, that rules are just not enough. And I think Jesus' reaction to these guys, I think, will help us to DTR, to help define our relationship with the Lord and identify the fan and follower relationship a little more closely. So I want to begin by looking at Matthew 23, in the beginning of that chapter, uh, starting with verse 2 on the screens, I'll read verse 1 here. But I want to look at the heart of a fan. A heart of a fan. Chapter 23, verse 1, which isn't up there, says that Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, he was talking to everybody, and he said in verse 2, the teachers of the law, he's kind of calling these guys out, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. Get this for they do not practice what they preach. They do not practice what they preach. So the first thing I want you to see about a, the heart of a fan is that fans don't practice what they preach. Jesus was talking about the hypocrites, the ones who put on a mask. It's not that they are just faking it. They're trying to do good, but deep down, nothing is changing in their heart. And you know, we, we've seen that happen throughout the gamut. I mean, you've seen preachers that stumble and fall and have addictions and have illicit affairs. But there are politicians that talk about, oh, we just want to help the poor. And then they, we look at their tax receipts and they give just a very teeny bit of percentage to charitable organizations. Or there are school teachers who want to educate students and they step over that line somewhere and you see one regularly that has a sexually involved relationship with a student. Hypocrites don't just occasionally stumble and fall. It's that the hypocrite really makes no attempt to be different in their heart, although they're following the rules. The fans don't practice what they pe preach. Secondly, fans make, it, make life difficult for others because of their double standard. Verse 4 reads this. Verse 4 says that they tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They demand a higher standard for those people around them than they do for themselves. And you know, you've seen episodes of this recently. <clears throat> I mean, there have been protesters around our nation, around the world really, talking from everything against war, uh, to against Wall Street and against greed and all this stuff. And you got these protesters protesting this stuff, and what are they doing? They're kind of warring with each other and causing fights and breaking in and stealing stuff. And that's what they say that they're against. That's hypocrisy, insisting on a different standard from others that you're just not willing to stand up and follow yourself. And that was at the heart of this group of teachers and Pharisees. And that's what Jesus was talking against. They kept preaching preach and teaching the Ten Commandments. And while they were doing that, they were plotting the death of Jesus because they didn't like this guy. They preached to others about helping the poor, but Jesus called them out because they didn't even help their own families to get by. Hypocrites repulsed Jesus because they set this double standard. And they judged others by a standard in which they didn't judge themselves. Thirdly, fans are concerned about image more than character. Verse 5 says, Everything they do is done for men to see. Everything these guys did was for show. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I, I really believe these guys were following the rules. It was just they had a heart problem. And that's the, the heart of a, of a hypocrite. They do things for show because they want to look good in front of people. They're more concerned about people than they are concerned about acting out for God. And there are people I think have grown up in church that I think are particularly vulnerable to this because you know what your parents want, you know what the religious organization or institution wants, and you learn all these rules and you learn to do right things, but on the heart, it's really not changed. So we, we keep up the externals, but it's really all smoke and mirrors. And that's why Jesus called these guys out. He said, you're whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside. But on the inside, you have dead men's bones because their heart wasn't right. And they just did things for people to see. Well, point D is fans cling to protocol in order to impress others. Verse 6 goes on, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. You know, if you go to the ball game or you go to the theater or you go to have dinner, you want that best seat, don't you? Last year, uh, a friend of mine took me to Lexington, Kentucky to see the University of Wildcats basketball play game. And, uh, you know, it's great down there in Rupp Arena. It's intense. And, and uh, when, you want, when you do that, you want, when you invite somebody, you, wanna, you want good seats to impress people. And when my buddy took me and we were setting up in our seat, I, was, I knew that I had friends of mine down at midcourt, and I was straining my eyes trying to see him because I wanted him to know that I was at the game. But, you know, it's natural to want the best seats, to be seen, to, to be there. I mean, that's just kind of human nature. And these Pharisees wanted to be seen by, by men. Look at verse 7. It says there that they love to be greeted in the marketplaces and had the men call them rabbi. But you're not to be called rabbi. You have only one master, and you all are brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he's in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have just one teacher. He's the Christ. Now, the Bible says we're to give honor where honor's due. And we need to respect those who are leaders in the church, those who are having a, a position of prominence, if you will. But there's only one teacher. There's only one Lord. And we're not to put that position above Christ. That's one of the reasons in the Christian churches that we've never been given to titles. You know, you, you don't call me Reverend Greg or the Pontiff, except when I'm wearing my hat that somebody got me in the office, but that's just for the private stuff to see. But you don't call me Father Greg. We're all brothers and sisters. So, you know, I have people, but, but we they give honor where honors do. I mean, they're missionaries, evangelists, and, and preachers. Where do you want to respect the elders? And, and give them that authority. But people ask all the time, you know, what should we call you? And I go, well, you know, Pastor Greg, Brother Greg. I said, Greg's just fine. Or maybe every now and then, Your Highness. <laughs> Whatever, you know, feels right at the moment. But the Pharisees, they, they were just into this thing. They loved big titles. And Jesus defined his relationship with them. We're all brothers. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners. We're all saved by grace. Jesus is the head of the church. Not the elder, not me, not anybody else. We're all on the same level playing field. Verse 11 goes on. The greatest among you will be servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Isn't that the way that it is? But the hypocrite gets all caught up in, no, you got to serve me. I'm more important than you. I'm better than you. Now, here's the worst characteristic. Is that thing popping? Is it okay? Sorry about that. Here's the worst characteristic of, of a fan. And we'll try that. It is that fans prevent others from following. Fans prevent others from following. Verse 13 reads this. Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you actor, you play actor. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. 
you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. I don't know how many people I've talked to over the years that have related a story about a church leader or somebody in the church that's really offended them uh, or, or something that happened. There was a church split and things never got mended. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and doctrine closely because of this. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. And I think church leaders especially can inflict harm more than somebody else in the church perhaps. And we have different roles. But you know, one of the number one excuses I hear uh, about people not attending churches, there's churches filled with hypocrites. Or this leader did that, or that leader did that. I'm not saying that they're not people ultra sensitive. But there are some things that go on in churches that are really offensive. And we need to be alert to that and aware of that. Jesus was so stern with these group of teachers that should have known better, so stern against hypocrisy. And he used the strongest language against these guys that he ever used. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. I mean, that's stern. It's no wonder the religious leaders wanted to kill this guy, Jesus. I mean, they were following the rules. But Jesus was kind of ruffling up because there was this heart issue going on that they would have nothing to do with. I mean, he censored. I mean, to anybody to think Jesus was passive and he turned a cheek against everything, they're just flat wrong. They've not read the scriptures. He censored these guys. He spoke with them at the, the harshest language. He called them fools, sons of hell, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites. What if I talked with you like that? You'd be out the door. You have to talk with me like that. That's why they plotted to kill this guy. But the rules that these guys followed said that, you know what, they were doing it right. They should have been followers, but they were fans. They were looked good on the outside, but on the heart they were messed up. They knew scripture. They'd even watched Jesus teach for three years, but they closed their eyes to the truth. They closed their eyes to the Messiah because they loved the rules more than they loved the relationship. They love the acting more than they love the Father. And Jesus still is giving these guys last-minute opportunity to open their eyes and open their ears. In verse 37, you see Jesus lament, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather you as your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing He's hard sick over their sham. He wants them to be different, but they have the heart of a fan. And they're stuck on these rules. And they've disregarded the rule maker. We read in another gospel in John, in chapter 8, that all these religious leaders and teachers, they, they got this mob together. And that's what happens when you're trying to follow rules. You get this mob mentality. And they yank this lady, who knows where they got her from. She probably just had on a bed sheet. And they run her to Jesus and say, look, this lady, we just caught her in adultery. Now, what do you say about that, Jesus? I think we better follow the rules and stone her, hadn't we? They were trying to trip Jesus up on all these rules. And they had caught somebody, case in point, and the rules said stone her to death. But Jesus had something else in mind. And let me, let me just put in a caveat here and a by-the-way moment. God has given us both guidance and commandments, and we do have commandments and rules that we should follow. They are for our protection. They are for being a people of integrity, a pe people of a good culture. All that counts. But all these guys were sold onto were the rules. And they gave this impression that if you follow the rules, you could be perfect like me. But that's not the purpose of the rules. And I think sometimes Christians and churches give off the impression, like these religious leaders, that you've got to be perfect. And you know what? Nobody could measure up to that. But they use the rules to manipulate. And the problem with that is that especially with people who are new to the church and they have a different background, that they give off the impression that you just don't belong here. 
And I really think that happens unintentionally. And probably the churches and the people who give off that impression are saying, we've got to have a high standard. We've got to have a high moral code. And they're right, but they make it difficult for people to come to Christ. Because they say, if you want to come to Christ, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to obey the rules. You've got to be perfect like us before you can get in, before we allow you into this place. And in the end, these well-intentioned people put up the front that these list of rules are what we got to have. But you know what? It wears people out because it becomes about the rules and not about the ruler and the hearts of a follower. And I want to look in this second point at the love of a follower. The heart of a fan identifies rules, but the love of the father, the love of a follower identifies the savior. I want to bring out a few points about rules. And number one is rules can be cumbersome. Rules can be difficult. I, grew, I, I did church camp as a, a dean for 10 years. And I tell you, part of, a large part of having a successful camp is you've got to have a list of rules. And we've got to have rule enforcers at camps. I usually did 10 and 11, 12 year olds. And uh, I had people cracking the whip. But we, uh, the people who led camp, we had this booklet of rules. And on the first day, within the first hours, we'd go over these rules. You've got to have your shorts only this high up. And we had people that would measure that stuff. And you can't have a tank top with spaghetti straps. That was the hardest. You know, you had to be two fingers wide. Or you had to just... And, you know, and don't get me wrong, you've got to have rules. But the problem with that was it became about the rules. And somehow, I think through Christian Youth Camp, these kids grew up through this system that if I keep these rules, I'm a Christian. That's what being a Christian is about. And somehow, they've gotten their eyes on the rules, and they've taken their eyes off the Savior. So here's this adulterous woman, humiliated, brought before Jesus, brought before these rule keepers, the guys who measure this stuff. And the Bible says that Jesus knelt down... And he, he got down on the ground. Here's this woman. There's the rulers. And it says that Jesus wrote something on the ground. And we're not told what he wrote. Some people speculate he might have been writing the sins of the people around him. He might have been actually writing names. He'd stand up and they had this thing. And they knew that Jesus had to follow the rules. And the rule was, you're going to stone this woman for adultery. And you remember Jesus' response, if you're familiar with the story? I mean, what, what wisdom. He who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says that one by one, those religious leaders started to walk away. Why was that? Because they knew that Jesus knew. And they knew they were guilty. And they walked away till it was just Jesus and this woman standing there. And he says, what now? What are you going to do? There's no accusers here. And she probably stood there and thought, yeah, there's one other person here that can't accuse me. And I think Jesus knew that, and she knew that too. And he said, you know what? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. She had every right to be stoned because she disobeyed the rules. But Jesus was more about forgiveness and go live your life without sin. I know there's rules here, but I love you more than I love the rule. Go and sin no more. Rules can be cumbersome when you look at it as a set of rules. But Jesus looks at the heart of love. Secondly, rules don't inspire grace. The grace that Jesus exhibited here to, for this woman not to be stoned even though the rules called for it, let just emphasize the, the grace. I mean, those who are tired of pretending know what it means to have grace in their lives. And he called, when you don't have grace, you've got all of this fear and all of this guilt deep down inside. And Jesus is speaking the words, all you who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. Because he is about this grace part. And maybe you grew up in a home or a church or a culture or a tradition that emphasized 
you fear God, you obey these rules, and that's part of it, and that's good. But then when you sin, what happens? You feel guilty because I don't measure up. None of us can measure up, and, does, and I'm not copying out. We've got to be the best people we can be. But if you grew up in that system, you begin to learn that if I obey the rules, I'm okay, but we can't. So we're walking around going, I don't even know if I'm saved. There are people that are about ready knocking on the door of heaven, I mean, age-wise, you know what I mean? And, and they're going, I don't even know if I'm safe. Think about it this way, about rules versus relationship. When I got married, I said I do to this long list of stuff. You know, Reverend Black gave me these rules. And I said, I want to love my wife. I want to be faithful to her as long as we both should live. And I am going to provide and protect her for better or for worse. I want to be committed to her for richer or for poorer. That's what I want to do. I, I'm married into that set of rules. But since I've gotten married, there's a lot of unspoken rules <laughs> that I've learned. I know when I come in the door, I'm not going to ask a question before I don't greet my wife properly. And I am going to not tell her everything that I am thinking at that moment. <laughs> but if I saw our relationship as a bunch of rules, I'd be worn out. I couldn't measure up to that. I wouldn't be happy. But because I love my wife, and I want to do everything for my wife, I do the dishes. I put the lid down on the toilet. I do all these other extravagant acts of love. But I sacrifice my life <laughs> for that joy that's before me. And in the end, this grace that we have is what the relationship's about. And that's the grace of God. It's this loving relationship because God knows when we love Him, we're going to do our best to follow Him. Augustine said, who can be good if not made so by loving? Love God and do as you please. He could say that because he knew that when you love somebody, that's a lot more than a bunch of rules. But your priority your emphasis has to be on that loving relationship. It has to be about a relationship with Christ or it won't work. We're going to listen to a little clip from Kyle Eidemann to kind of explain this a little bit better for us. It's not unusual for me to talk to Christian parents who are upset and concerned because maybe a college-aged child or an adult child is no longer following Jesus. And the parents usually want to know what happened. They want to know what went wrong. That's a hard question to answer. There's a lot of different possibilities, but I, I do my best just to listen to the story, to encourage them, and to pray for their child. But not long ago, I was uh, speaking in Houston, Texas, and after I was done speaking, this big man with this big belt buckle came up to me, but he had... Uh, had tears in his eyes, and he began to tell me the story of his prodigal daughter who had left home and had walked away from her faith, was no longer following Jesus, but he didn't ask me what happened. He didn't seem to be looking for an explanation. In fact, with one sentence, he told me what he thought went wrong. He said, we raised her in church but we didn't raise her in Christ. Do you ever go to the doctor and get an inoculation? They give you a little bit of a virus to try and make you immune to the real thing. I think that's what's happened to a lot of fans. They got a little bit of Jesus. Maybe at home, maybe at school, at church, a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of rules. Maybe a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of tradition, but one of the most deadly things that can happen to your faith is to have just a little bit of Jesus. We raised her in church, but we didn't raise her in Christ. One other point about rules. Rules don't keep us around. And I want to say this very carefully. When our kids grow up and they define Christianity by keeping a moral code, code instead of defining Christianity by following Jesus Christ, they're going to walk away from both. The statistics on kids growing up in church and going off to college or leaving home and falling away from Christ and the rules are staggering. They are at epidemic proportion, those who are walking away from the faith. 
But we think, you know, we've got to make sure that they understand the rules. We've got to understand what it is about their obligation as a Christian. And while that's true, what I'm trying to convey is that if they don't define Christianity as a relationship with Jesus Christ, they're going to walk away from both because they're going to be worn out. We must define Christianity first and foremost as following Jesus Christ and having that love relationship with Christ. And we cannot expect to recruit the world to a system of standards that we can't even live by ourselves if it wasn't for that loving relationship to want to do for Jesus Christ. And they're not going to get on board with that unless they know Jesus. And we're going to watch a video now of a fellow from our church that has recently understood that in a new way. Well, I was a good kid in high school. I was in choir and show choir and band, but yet I was doing heroin. I've been an ex-gang member now for about two years. I'm an ex-crip. You do a lot of stupid things in your addiction. I got slapped in the face by my dad and, and my mom and the rest of my family members saying, why do you keep screwing up? And this was just after I got out of rehab the first time and I didn't apply myself there. But I got out of the gang and that was rough to see all those, the people that I used to call my family gone. But then I had my real family back. So it's like a catch 22, it was perfect. But I was also still addicted at the time. One time when I first got out of rehab, I, I uh, that same day, my, I fell to my knees. I was just like, I can't, I don't want to crave this because I know if I do, I'm going to relapse. It's just helped me not to, to think that way anymore. Help me not to, to act that way anymore. And somehow, some way he listens apparently because I, I haven't craved it or thought about it in a hundred so plus days. Very personally, born again means something to me. I, did, I was debating back and forth whether or not I should get baptized and Greg and I have had so many talks about it. And he's like, if you read the Bible and you, and you really think on it, they got baptized the same day. They didn't, they didn't wait a week or a month or a year to get baptized. They did it the same day. And there's been plenty of talks that Greg and I have had over the past four months now about baptism that I believe that this is the right time for me. So if you can repeat after me, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And I accept him. I accept him. I accept him. As my Savior. As my Savior. Amen. 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 You now, because of your confession of faith and professing that Christ is my Savior, you now will be baptized in the name of the Father and the Holy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. For the complete forgiveness of sins. And you'll be raised up a new person. In Jesus. Amen. Bye. And we praise God for, for changed lives. And you know, somebody stopped me recently on the way out of worship, and they, they said, you know, and they asked me a question about what I would do being a minister in a situation. And uh, they related to me of an experience that happened several years ago, and they said they hadn't been to church since. And I, I don't know about you and your life, where you are, don't know what your story is. I don't know if you feel like you've been bullied by a pharisaical type of person in the past who's misrepresented the grace of Christ. I don't know if it was a church that maybe taught you a whole bunch of rules and traditions and regulations and maybe you've really not got around to studying about who Jesus is and why He is. And I don't know if you grew up with uh, a tradition that nobody really emphasized grace and they just talked about the rules. I want you to know here that Jesus simply says, we love you. I don't stand here to condemn you. I want the best for you. Go and sin no more. And if you'd like to have that type of relationship with the Father, let's define in terms 
that you can understand and that you can uphold, not that you're not going to ever fall short, but that you do your best to keep that relationship restored. You are invited to that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ today, right here and right now. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, Sometimes it's not easy to to live in this world, especially when we're living with other people. It's hard enough just sometimes getting through the day with the situations that go on with our family, let alone our extended family in the church, people in our culture. Father, you love us so much and you want the best for us and you want us to live harmonious lives together. And you know, we just can't do it by following a set of rules. And it it takes that love factor. And while we know that you're a a father of, of rules and they're for our own good, and that we know that when we break one rule, we're guilty and have that sentence of death, but Jesus came to provide us the grace for life and died in my place, died in our place. And grace is such a hard concept to understand because we're so galvanized to understanding that we got to follow the rules and while we do and while we're, they're good, that it takes that love. I pray that we could define our relationship with you by that love today, that we, we've all got all this stuff, this past that we grew up with. Some of us may be nothing at all. But I pray that you could speak to our hearts and minds today. That we don't just have to walk around with our head hung low because we know we're guilty. But that we've got you. That I've got a father that frees me up from that. He says, you know what? Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. I mean, we got the worst rule baker in a book, one of them, you know, adulterous woman. And Jesus said that to her, he can say that to me. I pray that we could love each other, that we're just not dogmatic about saying, you better step it up. You don't belong here. We do belong here because we're the church. We're your bride. And I pray that we could understand that love today. If we may need to make a decision to be baptized, if we've never done that, we've got to have our sins forgiven. That's the place to do it to start. We want to, if we just want to join this group and say, I'm here. If we need extra prayer, I pray that we take that step today to be bold, whatever it takes to define that relationship in the terms of love. I pray for us, I pray for me today that I could follow you. Jesus' name. Amen.